Uh, it's Hootie and the Blowfish here. So, uh, Darius, do you want to introduce the starting lineup here? This for is Mark Bryan on guitar, yep. Dean Ferber on bass, and Jim Sonnefeld on drums. And Dan Patrick on rubber chicken. Yes. What was the What was the second name that you guys were looking at, aside from Hootie and the Blowfish? <laughs> That's the only name. Mark and I were used to be the Wolf Brothers, but the worst name... Dean wanted to call us black and blue because they all had blue eyes and I was black. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that would have been a good name. <laughs> it would have been better than Hooting the Blowfish. Black and blues. Yes. But I, I do think the name did help you guys. Like it or hate it, you never forget it. And so I think it did help us. Because people could remember it. Yes, no one forgot the name. And there was something about that. But at, at any point, did you guys think we should change the name? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Basically, when Sony got in the band, we, we took a really, good hard look at it. We were playing clubs, and we were like, we should probably change the name. But we were already doing so well in, in a few places, we didn't want to start all over. We and were if you change yeah. your name, you're starting all over. We were drawing hundreds of people at that time. <laughs> 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 Big numbers. <laughs> if all 600 people had left because we changed their name, I mean, what would happen? Yeah. But, but also, when you look at this, we always look at an overnight success, but it took like. 20 years for an overnight success, or 10 years for you guys. But when I met you guys in, what, 94, you guys had been playing at frat houses and whatever for 10 nine years. years nine prior. Ten years, yeah, yeah, nine or 10 years. Yeah. At any point, how, how close did you guys come to just saying, this ain't going to happen? Never. I, yeah, because what else were we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> were we going to become sportscasters or something? <laughs> there was never a moment where we thought about not playing. Like, when we got our record deal, we weren't even looking for a record deal. We were doing so well in the clubs. We were making, we were playing the same clubs every six weeks, making, you know, we were all making over fifty thousand dollars a year just playing clubs. We were, we were content. We weren't even looking for a record deal. So you got came. free drinks, women, and, a, and, and you're making fifty k, and you're paying the bills. Yeah, yeah, it was perfect. But when you have hold my, the importance of hold my hand to this band, oh, was it, what? First of all, Sony when he came to audition for the band, the first thing he did was said, "I got a song." We said, "Play your song," and it was hold my hand. And so we were like, you're in the band, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was my hair. <laughs> oh, poor and, Sony and, and the and hair. That's, that's <laughs> so, it's also the song that, that David Letterman heard. And, you know, it's like, hey, I want that band on my show. And then that was the appearance that sort of broke, you know, the ice. So yeah. it was a pretty important song for us. Yeah, because I wonder that where you look at these bands and then I didn't know if you guys were worried about being a one-hit wonder. We weren't because we... By the time we got to recording Cracker Review, we had been playing Let Her Cry for several years. We'd been playing Only Want to Be With You for several years in the clubs and Hold My Hand. Yeah. So we had kind of a, a small little catalog of songs that were working as well as Hold My Hand in the bars. And that's that's the testing ground. If you can get 200 people in a in a club to sing along with you and then buy your cruddy little cassette for five bucks and take it home because they like it that much, you're, those are songs that are going to gonna last what was it like to hear that song on the radio for the first time oh it was uh, it was amazing it was i mean it freaked us out i think you just stare at the radio <laughs> like, <laughs> you do. Well, that, not back then because you didn't you know it was just a thing but uh it was funny for us it, we, there was one moment where it was too much i was i was in charleston and i'm driving on the road and uh, i got a radio on and the hootie song comes on and so i changed the channel it was after everything was big and i changed the channel and the next channel, it was a Hootie song on. And I changed the channel, and the next channel was a different Hootie song on. And I changed it a fourth time, and it was, time was the fourth one. And that was on, and I went, oh, my goodness. I really went, oh, my goodness, we're on every radio station in this town. It was crazy. But what happened, that first taste of success? I paid off my student loans. <laughs> <laughs> that, what about you guys? For, for us. It was like a, kind of a, a gut check of like, hey, this is... We're gonna do. This is what we really want to do. This is what we're passionate about, and we're gonna get to. We're gonna do this forever. I'll be honest yeah. with you. We didn't see the only success we saw was that we were the shows were getting bigger, because we were always on the road. It was never anything but touring. So the shows were getting bigger. Great. Yeah, I think it was also when uh, when we got a deal with BMW to be the South Carolina ambassadors and got free cars. That was like okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good. <laughs> Who did you guys open up for? You remember uh, Big Head Todd and the Monsters Head, was the they were first, first. Yeah, Toad the West Toad the West Brocket was second. That was it. Yeah, and then the middle of the Toad Tour, you could tell Ooh. everything had changed. I mean, it really, you, in the middle of the Toad Tour. Did you guys like, flip-flop? Yeah, we didn't oh, on stage, nice. but people coming to see us flip-flopped. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then Toe the Wet Sprocket decided to dissolve the band, I think. <laughs> oh, that, right? <laughs> they kept playing. They yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, REM was a big influence. You you make mention of Stipe in a song yeah. or two. Why was REM, why did, was that the same with everybody else that when, REM kind of resonated? When we were in college, that was, that, that was like the alternative scene was coming up and they were the, basically the poster children for that yeah, alternative I mean, scene. And, and their music was really influential on a lot of people, and, and we were one of those bands. And um, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we grew up with them, too. I mean, being in Columbia, they're from Athens. I think first time Darius and I went and saw them at the township, it was like half full, and then yeah. went back the next year, and it was sold out. And uh, so, I mean, it, that and we just listened to them to death. Yeah, yeah, when I joined the band in 89, it should have said, who are you the blowfish? And then in parentheses, an REM cover band. <laughs> <laughs> like, they sent me a demo of, like, uh, a cassette of, like, 30 songs, and... 18 of them were REM songs. I'm like, uh, there was a point in our set list. There was a point in our set list where we had 12 REM songs. <laughs> a favorite cover song for each one of you guys to play? Uh, oh, good question. Interstate Love Song is what we keep going Stone, back. Stone keep coming up. Yeah, it just rocks and it's fun. And we, we do this thing in the middle of uh, Only Want to Be With You where we play Get Down On It by Cool in the Game. <laughs> I love that. Every time. We, <laughs> yeah. I still can't believe we can play that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Dean, what about you? I mean, Interstate Love Song is a great one. Uh, Champagne Supernova is another another great one. We used to open up the set with a song by this band called the Rave Ups, uh, called uh, How Long Are You Keep On Telling Me If You Want to Be Happy, You Want to Be Free. Yeah. We, I think we thought <laughs> that was killer. Yeah. I, what was the name of the song? How, uh, I don't know. How come free, all uh, this, you can't curse. How come all this stuff comes down on me? Must be a th What is the name of that song? I don't remember, but it was great. It was that good. Yes. And then you did Fight the Power. We do, we do fight the power. It was, so, it was so funny, you know. We, we were opening up for Jason Aldean in, uh, in, this, in the Atlanta in their, in their, in their baseball stadium, and we do fight the power. And some, uh, some country DJ comes on and he's telling everybody to burn our records because we're, we're singing "Fight the Power." I'm like, are what? you freaking kidding me? I was like, kind of like Jack, are you a fool? We played that song for twenty something years. I was like, making us political is hilarious. Why did people turn on Hootie and the Blowfish? It was so big. It, yeah. it, it was so big. Just everywhere. I mean, the. I mean, it's a great problem to have. Yes. Yeah. But but it felt like they were mad at themselves for liking you guys. Like I like, how did I like the? I'm so mad at myself. I'm going to take it out on somebody. And wasn't there the bumper sticker? Maybe you saw it, Martin. Yeah. Was that in Baltimore or something? Yeah. Honk uh, if you hate Hootie. No, just F Hootie. Oh, oh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, honk. And, and make it too, too deep. With, a, with, three, with three more letters. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It don't and, waste your time, honk. But now it's come full circle. It is. It is. It's so funny for me because uh, back back in 96, I won uh, that GQ Man of the Year in music. And the, the whole story, the last paragraph, the guy says, don't worry, Hootie and the Blowfish, you guys will get respect when John Daly is on the, uh, when John senior Daly tour. is on the senior tour. And sure enough, John's on the senior <laughs> tour. We finally, we're finally getting respect as a band. It's I, awesome. I remember seeing the New York Times article before the tour started, and I think I sent it to you because I got it on Saturday, and it was the Sunday edition. And I went, I think I sent it to Sony, too. I go, what the? Yeah. And, and because I said it took this long for then these critics to kind of circle back and go, you know what, on second thought, yeah, it's like critics did the same thing. Like, you know, they're, it's simple, like, what is this? And, and now I think that it's great to see that they kind of had this epiphany and said, you know, on second thought, they were pretty, you sold 25 million of Cracked Rear View, right? Yeah. Worldwide? I think, I think critics couldn't like us because we had just killed the form of music that they adored so much. You know, we had just wait. What did you kill? Grunge. I oh. mean, if you look at the if you look at the timeline, when Hootie came, grunge ended. That's when Maxbox Pretty got their deal and all those. So ninety four. Yeah, is when is really when they start, they stopped playing on the radio. When we started playing us. Do you take credit for killing grunge? <laughs> I, yeah. Oh, whoa! 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 <laughs> you can keep that twenty. You can keep the twenty. <laughs> I've been on the show eighteen hundred times, and that's the first time I've cursed. It's, you know what? Like satellite that. radio has spoiled us. <laughs> what, what has happened to you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm the old black guy in the club. <laughs> <laughs> Hootie and the Blowfish joining us here in the Man Cave and their new album, Imperfect Circle, will be available everywhere. And that is uh, starting today for the commercial break. I teased that there was uh, an incident on the road many, many, many years ago that you uh, you told me. Now, is that the craziest moment you've had on the road 
Where oh. you got into a fight? No, we had uh, the Albuquerque was a great fight. We got we got in a fight in uh, uh, in, either Kalamazoo in Ann Arbor, in Ann Arbor or, Michigan. Yeah. Okay, we're in this bar in Ann Arbor, and it's us. We meet Tiger, an 18 year old Tiger Woods, for the first time, and the Stanley Cup shows up at this bar from the Red Wings. And okay. so we're walking out, and Jeff, we're just walking, and all of a sudden, a snow, we're throwing snowballs with with these guys, and we think it's funny, and all of a sudden, a snowball hits the wall, and it's got a bottle in it. Ooh. It's got a bottle in it. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at Sony, and Sony runs across the street. And yeah. I'm like, if Sony's going, I'm going. And we're across <laughs> the street, and we're <laughs> battling what, what these What was guys. it, like a scene out of Braveheart? It was. Where you guys are, like, Sony's <laughs> under the car. Sony's under the car beating one guy. <laughs> and the other guy jumps in his car. He's trying to drive. I'm punching him in the car as he's driving. <laughs> it, was, it was vicious. Are but, you guys famous? No. No. We, were, no. we were just starting to. We were playing out a string of clubs. It was just starting to take off. We had just Did right Tiger there. get involved in this? No. He, we left no. him in the bar. Okay. No. That would have but been a great the Albuquerque story, story. The okay. real quick. Okay. We're in Albuquerque. Sony's got a hat on, and they, the bouncer comes upstairs where we are and says, take your hat off. Takes, he takes his hat off. Not thinking. He's little little buzz. Puts it back on. Bouncer asks us, take a hat off again. Takes the hat off. Goes downstairs. We're all we're having a great time. Having a great time partying. We look down. These three cowboys walk in with their cowboy hats on. We wait for about 15 or 20 minutes, and <laughs> nobody tells them to take their hats off. So Sony puts his hat back on. So there's about five or six of us up there, and we look up. And we see five or six bouncers walking up the steps. So we instantly know it's on. So the guy's yelling at Sony. So <laughs> our security guy, Buddy, pushes Sony out of the way, pushes Sony out of the way and goes, so, you know, don't talk to him, talk to me. And in about 15 seconds, it was on. it's on. I mean, we're in a full-out bar, bar, bar fight. <laughs> Roadhouse. You know, Roadhouse. I, I, I grew up fighting. It's no big thing, you know, no big thing to me. So I'm, fight, I'm fighting my guy, and I'm, I'm doing really well. And I'm looking around, and I realize... Everybody in Hootie the Blowfish is killing somebody. <laughs> I mean, Sony is just destroying this guy. Mark is just, I'm like, Mark doesn't even fight, and Mark is just beat the heck I'm out like, of this guy. Mark. You know, I'm and like, uh, we're like, oh my, all of a sudden, so we whoop these guys, we whoop these guys, and we're leaving. And as we leave, the, the owners walk, the owner comes up, because the cops are going to show up and everything. It was a bar fight. The owner goes, up, he says, what's going on? What's going on? I say, let me tell you. You know me, Dan. When I'm mad, I'm really mouthy. And um, I'm mad. And I said, you need to get some new bouncers. He's like, what are you talking about? I was like, you need new bouncers. Who didn't a bullfish just whooped everybody? <laughs> and I said, I did not just say public enemy. I said, who didn't the bullfish just whooped everybody? <laughs> and Buddy, by the way, Buddy, Buddy uh, bench pressed a guy, or not bench, standing pressed a guy bigger than him. Uh, and dropped him on a pool table. The, the greatest move I've ever seen in a fight. Buddy's kind of short. Buddy's your security guy. Right, he's short, and B Buddy's fighting this guy, but he's looking around to make sure everybody's okay. You know, I could tell he's looking to make sure everybody's okay, and he trips over a pool table. And Buddy's short, so Buddy's on this pool table, and his feet aren't on the ground. And this big guy sees Buddy, and he jumps on Buddy, and Buddy took this guy and threw him <laughs> straight up in the air and slammed him so hard on the, on the pool table, Everybody stopped fighting. <laughs> I'm serious. He slammed this guy so hard to put there. Was hey, 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 this is over. I, I, this is over. I, I, crazy thing, I heard Buddy yell corner pocket. Right <laughs> <laughs> Greatest move I've ever seen in a fight. Yeah. Wouldn't you love to have a tape of that night? I would. I wish felt cell phones were big then, because I would love to see that. Because I'm, I'm telling you, I looked around. It's like we are killing these guys. I'm like, wow, y'all. Y'all need some new bouncers in here. But did you ever have any of those moments on stage? Because I've, I've stood next to Buddy, your bodyguard, and I go, dude, you got the easiest job ever. Real, real, real quick. You can vape this, over here and nobody cares. I'm doing this thing. I'm playing, I'm playing a club. I'm playing a club, some radio show from a country band, and I see these two boys, these two guys talking, and one guy's telling his buddy I'm going up, and the, the buddy's like, I'm not going. So sure enough, I see him, and here he comes, so I just back off, and I see it, and Buddy comes running. It's on, it's on the internet, and Buddy hit this guy like Michael Strahan coming <laughs> off the corner, and, and he just took this guy out. And so the guy goes down, and long story short, about about a week later, we get our lawyer to send us a letter, <laughs> and the letter says that the guy's suing us. And Buddy, you know, Buddy, you know, the guy's in a wheelchair. He's suing us and everything. <laughs> and so Buddy is, like, waiting for me to be the, you know, I'm always the reason. You know, we'll be all right. We'll handle this. And I looked at Buddy and said, oh, my God, I can't help you with this. this is, and I looked at him, <laughs> and I said, oh, man, the Laura fees alone. <laughs> 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 it was awesome. We messed with him for a day. But, you know, it was awesome. And I've told this story before when you guys were in Vegas and you got word that Bob Dylan wanted Couple hundred thousand dollars yeah. for uh, no, he, he he wanted one fifth of the album. <laughs> That's what he wanted. Oh, he did. That's what they asked yes. for. We're like you're crazy. And and so you sampled from Bob Dylan. We didn't sample. Did we, you steal? we used the lyric. 
Yeah, what I don't understand how that works. I, we we used a considerable lyric and had gotten permission to do it just a year or two earlier on an earlier officially version. on on, on earlier. the same yeah the same song. Uh, only want to be with you. What they actually said was it wasn't, we didn't rip them off. It was actually a tribute to them, and they were fine that we used it. Yeah. Yeah. So we did the exact same song a year later, just re-recorded the exact version for Cracked Review, and it became a huge hit. And suddenly their oh. lawyers needed to come back and say, uh, well, you didn't get permission to do it for the, the second, second record. recording. Yeah. You only get permission for the first recording. Wow. Yeah, they got us on the technicality. Yeah. And then you got Dylan back by doing Wagon Wheel. Yeah, and giving him more money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I got him back. I got him back. That damn, that damn Dylan. And giving him more millions. I yeah, know. that's good. Uh, do you remember the first time I came on stage with you guys? You've been on stage so much, I do not remember that. No. Yeah. Still trying to forget. You? Uh, really? Wetlands, maybe? Wetlands? I think the first thing I, I remember, the first the, what I do remember was in my here in my headphones, I'm hearing this awful sound. <laughs> and I know it's for percussion. It's not it's like a cymbal, but it's not really a cymbal. Oh, you're, you're, I'm like, what is that? And I look over and they had taken the tambourine from Dan because he was trying to destroy it. They'd taken all the drumsticks from him. Shakers. And they had taken the shakers from him. <laughs> and so he had resorted to taking a rubber chicken and beating the hell out of the cymbal. I did. You just, and it was the worst sound ever. I, I was angry at you guys <laughs> because you took away all my toys. But I mean, so innovative, really. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, if uh, my mic was on, I was singing. You were singing. Yeah, I was, and, and I love it. Here's Darius, and he's got, you know, 15, 20,000 people in front of him. And I'm trying to get his attention by singing. <laughs> and I, you know, I'd be like, uh, oh, oh, black water, God. keep on rolling. And then, <laughs> and then he would turn around and be like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> you're <yeah>. awful. <laughs> I love how whenever we call you out on two, you're like, Gary's throwing me off. Gary's throwing <laughs> yeah. off. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this percussion player, not, he's not playing in my rhythm. He's not playing in my and rhythm. And it was only the one time I took my shirt off, and that was when we were in Scotland. And that Man. was when I realized how white you really are. Yeah, and that's when, because <laughs> Sony would take off his shirt. You guys had a, a video where he has his shirt off playing the drums. Yep. And I thought that would be funny if he looked over and I had my shirt on. And it was. And it was. <laughs> it was very funny. I, 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 I couldn't sing half a song that day because of <laughs> you with your shirt on. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune in to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV. Stream for free on VR Live or download the Dan Patrick Show app.